welcomed you, but I want to welcome all of you here today and those that are also uh, just joining us online. And I just want you to know, um, maybe this is your first time here or the first time in a long time. Uh, we just want you to know that our doors uh, are wide open to you and to your family, uh, regardless of where you might be on your spiritual journey. We're just really glad that you're here and uh, we, we hope you'll keep coming back. I'd love to also, if you're new, uh, meet you and just uh, uh, begin to hear your story. I'll be right here in the front uh, after uh, service, and we could connect there for a few minutes before you head home. Well, listen, uh, we've been in this series that we're calling Take Back Your Life. And the premise of this entire series is that we are living in a world that has lost its mind. We are living in a world that has gone totally mad. And it's trying to take us and our souls hostage with it. But, you know, living in this mad world, it's often uh, leads us to feelings of just being trapped or exhausted or helpless. But there is a solution. Things can change. But all change, it starts right here in your mind. All change starts in your mind. And while it's true that my thoughts run my life, I have the power to control my thoughts, and so do you. And when we start thinking better thoughts, we can start living better lives. We need to learn how to think like Jesus. Because when I learn how to think like Jesus, my life gets better and I get better at life. This whole series is based off of this one scripture. It's in Acts chapter three, verse 19. And if there's one thing, if there's one word, if there's one phrase that I believe God has for us here at Community Church for 2022, it's this right here. It says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing might come from the Lord. And there's that phrase, times of refreshing. I'm praying and I'm believing God for times of refreshing to come from the Lord over you, over your house, over your kids, come on, over your grandkids, over your job, over your boss, over your employees, over your business, come on, over our mountain and community, over our nation, that times of refreshing might come from the Lord that he would refresh our thoughts, our minds, our attitudes, our actions, that he'd refresh us in our relationships and, and he would refresh us in our, in, our, in our body, in our spirit, in every sphere of influence that we have in our life. But that time of refreshing, it all starts with this word right here, repent. And that word simply means to change your mind. I know that word's gotten a bad rap, and maybe rightfully so for some that would stand in pulpits like this or street corners that would abuse it. But that word repent simply means to change your mind or have a mind change. To start thinking different. To starting to look at life less and less from your perspective and more and more from God's perspective. And so today I want to teach you a super practical way of how to change your mind about temptation. Because if you want to take back your life, you need to take on temptation. And the way that you win the war against temptation is to change your mind about temptation and what it is and how to fight it and how to win. You can't win the war against temptation with willpower. Willpower won't work. If willpower worked, you would have beat that temptation a long time ago. You need to win the war against temptation first and foremost in your mind. And there's nobody better in all the Bible to teach us how to battle temptation and win the war first in our mind than a guy named James. James was the half-brother of Jesus. He grew up in the same house as Jesus had the same mom and dad as Jesus. 
But James didn't believe that his own brother's claims that he was the Messiah, the son of the living God. That was until Jesus went to the cross, died, and then rose again three days later. You see, that's, that's what it takes to convince your younger brother that you are the son of God. Well, James became a believer that day, and God gave him a place of significant influence as the church began. And he became a pillar of the New Testament church. And in his self-titled book, James teaches us how to fight and win the war against temptation. Because if we're going to take back our life, we need to take on temptation. How many are ready to take on temptation? Come on. Are you sick and tired of losing the same fight, the same battle? Come on. We're going to fight and we're going to win. We're going to be victorious. Come on. In the strong name of Jesus Christ. And so if we're going to take on temptation, James says this, I need to understand the purpose of temptation. If you're taking notes, you want to write that down. I need to understand the purpose of temptation in my life. Look what he says. James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So God has a promise for you. It's called this crown of life that you will receive, not only rewards here in, on, on earth, but a reward in heaven, a crown of life. That God has come that you might have life, Jesus said, life in all of its fullness, not only here but for all eternity. What's the key to receiving the crown of life? It's to to stand firm under trial. That word trial comes from the Greek word uh, pierosmos. Pierosmos means, means a trial or a test. And if you stand firm under the test, if you pass the test, the pierosmos, you will receive, this is a promise from God, a crown of life, James says. But then he goes on in verse 13, he says this, but when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Now what's interesting is that this word tempted in the Greek is pierosmos. You say, wait, time out, Jimbo. What are you talking about? How can you say uh, pierosmo and it's translated, it's translated as trial in the previous verse, and now you use the same exact word, almost in the same breath, and now it's translated temptation. Like what in the world is go? Is it trial or is it temptation? Remember, he's trying to teach us something that's foundational so that we can understand the purpose of temptation. Now, while it's true, Our outward trials and also our inward temptations, they often look the same. But it's only in the context that helps us to distinguish the difference between a trial and a temptation. And here's what James is trying to teach us, that God uses trials to help me grow, to develop me to a a man or a woman of character and integrity and spiritual maturity. How does God do it? Through trials, through testing. And it helps helps me grow. But Satan, he uses temptations to cause me to sin. Satan uses temptations, things that he knows that, that if, I, I, if, if I take the bait, it will cause me to sin. It's all a matter of context, and it's all a matter of motivation to distinguish between a trial and a temptation. It's like if you have a brand new car that rolls off the assembly line in Detroit, one mechanic might run a battery of tests to uh, identify all the good things about the car. Another mechanic might run a, a series of tests to identify and troubleshoot all the bad things about the car. It's all a matter of motivation. It's like a thug or a thief who would take out a switchblade to, to rob some, mug someone. They take that knife out to rob and to kill. Or it's like a, a surgeon who also takes out a scalpel. And when they cut the flesh, their purpose is to heal and to mend. It's all a matter of motivation. Satan is like a murderous tempter but God is like a skilled surgeon. So here's the question. How do I deal with temptation? 
Well, let's go back to see what Pastor Jim says. Here's what he says. But each person is tempted. Would you say that with me? Each person is tempted. Say it again. Each person. So which, which person? It's all of us, right? Every single person. I'm tempted. You're tempted. Every, this is something that's common to all of us. Every single one of us is in the same battle. It's in the, we're in the same fight. Here's what we need to understand. Jim is saying this. I need to understand the personal nature of temptation. The personal nature, because each person is tempted. Each person. So temptation is, it's universal. We all have to go through it. It reminds me of the young story, uh, uh, the story of a young priest. And he, um, he was, you know, new on the job. First day ever. Uh, work in the confessional booth. At the end of the day, uh, he meets with his mentor, and he says, hey, Father, uh, this older priest, how did I do? And uh, the older priest said to the younger priest, well, uh, when a person finishes confession, you need to say something other than, wow, you did what? See, we shouldn't be surprised by temptation because we all face it. We shouldn't be intimidated by temptation or embarrassed by temptation because it is universal. Every single one of us fights temptation. Uh, we'll never outgrow temptation. You're tempted. I'm tempted. We're all tempted every day. That's why the, uh, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, no temptation has overtaken you except what is, what is the word? Common to man. This is a very common thing to experience temptation. Did you know that even Jesus himself was tempted on more than one occasion? It says this in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 18, and now he, referring to Jesus, came to help those who are tempted because he himself suffered and was tempted. If you go down to Hebrews chapter 4, it says this, for our high priest, again, referring to Jesus himself, he's able to understand our weaknesses. How? Because he was tempted in every way that we are but he did not sin. So Jesus, even Jesus himself, had to fight this fight against temptation. It's interesting, though, that um, he never sinned. You see, listen, it's not a sin to be tempted. It's only a sin, it only becomes sin when we give in to it. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. So it's not a sin to, it's not a sin to, to, to be tempted, um, Jesus was perfect, he never sinned, yet he was tempted. I think a lot of people are so intimidated that they don't even want to be real or vulnerable to act like, yeah, I, I experience temptation. Listen to me, friend. Temptation proves that you are human, not that you are evil. I would go as far as to say this. You will never reach a point in your walk of faith as you pursue living a fully surrendered life for Jesus that you will not experience temptation. Like you're never gonna come to the zenith of your you know, maturity in Christ that you won't experience temptation. In fact, the opposite is true. The more you pursue living a fully surrendered life to Jesus, the more you become mature in your faith, the more temptation you're going to face. Is this helping anybody? All right, are we helping you? Okay, so listen. Temptation, it's universal. Each one of us, James says, is tempted. But it's also very personal. What, what you may be tempted by, I might not be tempted by. And what I might be tempted by, you might not be tempted by. So uh, we need to understand the temptations that trip our triggers. If we're going to be able to fight and to win, we need to be able to set up safeguards to prevent ourselves from you know, being put in situations that might compromise our walk with God and our testimony. This is why Paul says this in Ephesians chapter four. Do not give the devil a foothold. Like don't even give him a little itsy bitsy inch into your life because this is personal. So my question is, what area of your life would the devil use as a foothold to cause you to sin? Do you know? You better know. You better figure it out real fast because I'll tell you who knows. This guy knows. And he will use that thing 
to try to cause you to sin. You know, here's some questions that you can, because it's personal. Nobody can answer these questions but you, because it's your life. These are battles, these are demons that you fight. Might be different than mine. So I want to give you just a few questions that can help you begin to identify these. Is that, is that going to be helpful? All right, write this down, grab your phone. Here's the first question you can ask when trying to d- figure out what is the thing that the de- devil could use as a foothold in my life. Um, here's the first question. When am I tempted? When? When is it? Is it when you're home alone? Is it when you're on a business trip? Is it a certain day of the week? I'll tell you when I'm tempted most. Monday. <laughs> Baby, you got to pray for your pastor on Mondays. <laughs> Mondays are hard for me. I preach in here, work all week, get up here and preach. And on Mondays, I mean, I wake up with a preacher's hangover. I'm, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. Things didn't go well. I'm all discouraged. Even if things went well, I could still get discouraged. The devil just comes out after me and just leading in this time of, you know, just pray for your pastor on Monday. All right? If you're going to pray for me any day of the week, pray for me on Monday. So I know that. I know I'm pro- My wife knows that. My kids know that. I could be tempted, tempted to lose my temper, or fly off the handle, or be discouraged, be depressed. You know, all those kinds of things. Or, or even if things go really well. I mean, there's times, you know, after I preach, I, I would just like a little trap door just to whoosh, open up and I just leave. I'm just out of here. Nobody sees me, right? And then there's times when it's like, you know, I want to do, you know, victory laps around the parking lot. Hey, it's Pastor Dave. That was a really good message today, you know. So, I mean, there, there's, there's ties of both. I was just being honest, right? So, I know for me, um, Mondays uh, can be really t- tempting for me. I could be prone to temptation. So, when are you most tempted? Think about it. Is it, you know, late at night? Is it early in the morning? Here's another question. Where are you most tempted? Ask yourself, where am I most tempted? Where is it? Is it at work? When you're sitting in the break room, trying to get all the latest tea on the office gossip, you know, all the, you know, who's knowing what, and some of you attempted just to gossip and just getting everybody's business, and you want to know, oh, tell me more. Oh, I don't know. She did what over the weekend? He hooked up with what? What's going on? It, you know, you know that's sin, right? Like, we all know that's, that's not what we're supposed to do. But for some of you, like, that's your thing, man. That's like... Like, you don't get tempted going to a bar. Like, alcohol is not your thing. Or maybe like when David was a kid, drugs was his thing. You know, for you, like, you're not tempted, you know, standing in front of a bar. But for you, it might be when you're standing in front of your fridge at 10 o'clock at night. You can do a lot of damage with a pint of Ben and Jerry's, Chunky Monkey. I'm just... You can do a lot of, you can do some stuff you shouldn't be doing. You need to repent. I'm just saying. I mean, food maybe is your thing. Maybe it's not booze or alcohol or drugs or gossip. When? Where is it? You know, when you're on that business trip to Vegas or to some other town and nobody knows you? Or is it when you're sitting in your house or your apartment all alone in front of your laptop? In front of the screen on your phone, you need to answer this question. Be honest with yourself. How about this one? Uh, Who's with me when I'm most tempted? Who are you with? Is it when you are by yourself? Or is it when you're with just a, as David shared. By the way, wasn't David's story just so amazing? Thank you, David. for. Or is it when you're with a certain crew group of people that whenever you're with them or with her or with him, it's just like they just draw you right into temptation. So who is it? You know, you might even ask yourself this question. What am I thinking or feeling when I'm tempted? That's a good question to ask. What are you thinking? Oh, if I could have this, have them do this, do that, then I'll feel great. Because all the other pain 
is too much to bear. Is that what you're thinking? Are you thinking, well, no one else is going to know. I'm not hurting anyone. I'm just having some fun. It's not illegal. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? These are some really powerful questions that, that will help us set up the safeguards that we need in our life. And then Pastor James says this, if you're going to take on temptation, I need to take responsibility for temptation. Like, gang, we got to just own this. we got to take responsibility for temptation. Here's how he puts it. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. Like, God, this is your fault. God, this is your fault for tempting me, for putting me here in this situation, for letting my eyes fall on that one thing or person. No one should say God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. If we're going to take on temptation and win, we need to take personal responsibility for it. I know it's really easy to shift the blame past the buck and put it on somebody else, but if you're going to fight and you're going to win this battle, you need to own it. Take responsibility for it. Don't blame somebody else. Don't blame your parents. Don't blame your ex. Don't blame, you know, your teacher. Don't blame the government. It's so easy to blame others. It's, easier to bl- it's so easy to blame God. God, this is your fault. Or it's really, you know who's really easy to blame? The devil. It's so, he's such a, an easy target, right? Like whenever you screw up, you know, it's the devil made me do it. I remember when Beck and I were first married and we had to go to this function and she needed a dress and we had a certain budget. She went out and she bought this cute little black number. <laughs> oh, anyway, that's beside the point. Um, <laughs> so she put it on for me and she was like, I was like, wow, that's great. I was like, how much did you pay for it? It was like four times the budgeted amount. And I was like, Beck, what were you thinking? And she's like, well, you know, the devil made me do it. <laughs> and I'm like, why didn't you say, get thee behind me, Satan? And she said, I did. And he said, it looked good from back there, too. (laughs) Sorry. That's an old preacher joke. I've been using it for 30 years. And I still like it. Listen, guys. uh, If we're going to win it, this war, we have to own it. Take personal responsibility. We need to grow up. Quit passing the buck grow up. It's not God's fault. It's not the devil's fault. It's not the government's fault. It's not your parents' fault. Own it. That is a sign of maturity. And then um, James says this, if we're going to take on temptation, I need to understand the pattern of temptation. Now, don't miss this. Seriously, lean into this part because this, um, I mean, you've been fighting this besetting sin for some of you, for years and decades. And you'll have periods of victory, but then you'll find yourself, boom, right back into it. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? If you could understand, this is what Pastor Jim is trying to teach us here. If you and I, if we could understand the, t- the pattern of temptation, because the devil is so stinking lazy. He's got nothing new up his sleeve. He's got no new tricks. He's been doing this from like the beginning of time. And while temptation is, is, is personal, the pattern is typical. While temptation itself, it's just a, you know, it's a little bit something different for everybody. But how temptation works, the pattern of it, it's the same for everyone. And so James is trying to help us Uh, understand the pattern of temptation. He says this in verse 14, but each person, we already covered that, is tempted, and when they are dragged away by their own evil, we'll talk about that in a minute, their own evil desire, everybody say desire, Desire. and they're enticed. So step one in the pattern is desire. That's where it starts. It starts with a desire. Friend, temptation is, It comes from within. Listen to how Mark puts it. For it is from within, out of a person's heart. Evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. Where does it come from? 
from within. It's a desire that comes from within. Temptation is an inside job. See, God gives us good things. Work, money, pleasure, sex, food. And then Satan, he tempts us to become obsessed with those good things. See, good things can become bad things when they become obsessions. He'll take a good thing, like work, and tempt us to become a workaholic or addicted to work, which then becomes a bad thing. You see how Satan works? Obsession can turn a good thing into a bad thing, but it all starts on the inside, so Satan will take a legitimate good need or desire put in our hearts by God himself and twist it and pervert it into an obsession. Here's the uh, step two, is deception. Look what he says next, deception. So it starts with desire, and the second step is deception. Each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. This word dragged away, it comes from a hunter's term. It means to trap or to ensnare. This word enticed, it's a, a fishing term. It means to bait or to lure. Now, I love to hunt, and I love to fish. And any good fisherman will tell you that the key to catching a, a lot of good fish and big fish uh, is the type of bait that you use to entice or to lure uh, the fish to, to take the bait. And that's what Satan does. He tries to lure us to take the bait, to deceive us into thinking that this thing that's in front of us will be good for us when in fact it'll really hurt us. And he, he, puts, he likes to put nice things in front of us, shiny things, like fun things, good things in front of us, uh, flashy things, hoping that we will take the bait. And that was the first trick he used in the book when he deceived our first mom, Eve. You guys remember this story? He made Adam and Eve, right? He made, God made all creation. He said, man, what I did, it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. Then the crowning act of this creation was, was when he made you and me, the humanity, in his image. So this is good. And he promised to, you know, place them in this garden, the Garden of Eden, and to provide for all of their needs. And he said, you can have anything you want in the garden. You can eat the fruit of any tree you want, except this one tree that he planted in the middle of the garden, and that tree was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He said, you can eat from any tree, but do not eat the fruit from this tree, because if you eat that fruit, you will surely die. And so we understand that to mean that that God created us as an object of his affection and love and that he as a good father wants to provide for all of our needs but he wants us to trust him and trust him alone and that meant don't eat from that tree because it's the tree of trust it's the trust tree because up until that point it was God and God alone that decided what was good and what was evil for us that's why he named the tree the tree of knowledge of good and evil because it was God who decided what is good and what is evil for us. And if you'll just trust me with that, oh, you'll live. You'll have a crown of life. But we know our mom was sitting there under that tree one day and Satan comes along and, and uh, like he does to deceive her, and he says, hey, why don't you look up that fruit? Doesn't that really look good? Right? And he says, um, well, God, he told you not to eat from any of these trees, didn't he, Eve? No, that's a lie. He actually said, you can eat from any tree you want except this one. You see how he works? There's nothing new. And the Bible says that Eve looked at the fruit and it says that it looked good for food. And Satan says, well, did God, you know, did he, did he really say don't eat this? Uh, yeah, he said don't eat it. 
Did he really say it? He's creating, you know, doubt. You know, go ahead, Eve, just try it. Oh, it'll taste good. You're not going to die. In fact, Eve, if you eat it, you will become a god. So it all starts with desire, and then it leads to deception, and then three, it leads to disobedience. This is when we take the bait. He says this next, after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And this is where temptation becomes a sin, when we give in to it. It's not a sin to be tempted, but it becomes a sin when we give in to it. You know, recall, James says, God uses the trials, the, the, the pierosmos, the trials to do what? To help us to grow, to develop character and integrity, to help us to become more like Him. You see, because our attitudes, the kind of thoughts that we have, they shape our attitudes, and when you combine them then with our actions, that equals our character. And Satan's goal is, Satan's goal in, in temptation to deceive our thinking, our attitudes uh, towards a legitimate need. And once those thoughts and once those attitudes are deceived, he says, hey, it's not a big deal. Hey, I'm, uh, you know, you're right, I'm not hurting anyone. This isn't illegal and I'm just having some fun. He can change then and corrupt our actions which leads to sin. And the Bible teaches us here that it all starts in our mind. It all starts in our mind, but then it ends up in our actions and our character. So desire leads to deception. Deception leads to disobedience. And number four, last of all, disobedience leads to death. Here's what he says. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. That's the horrible consequences of losing the war against temptation. It's right here. It's death. Death of a marriage. Death of a friendship. Death of a family. Death of a career. Death of friendship, potentially death of your physical body, and potentially what's, what's worst of all is the death of your soul. That's the tragic consequence of, of giving in. You know, again, James said, God uses trials so that you could grow, because if you if you stand up into the day of testing, you will receive what? A crown of life. But Satan uses temptation to cause you to sin, and sin leads to death. So what's the key now to overcoming temptation? How do we overcome it when it comes knocking on our door? Well, James ends this part of his message on a real high note. And here's what he says. You need to change your focus. Change what you think about. Look what, it, look what he says. This is pivotal, the pivotal part of the entire part of his message. He says, listen, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. Who does not change like shifting shadows? Like up until this point, it's a pretty heavy message, isn't it? And maybe you're even feeling that yourself. You're talking about desire and deception and, you know, disobedience and, and death. And it's like, it's pretty rough, right? But that's the raw reality of losing the battle against temptation. But then he says, here's, here's how to overcome. Here's how to break free. Here's what you need to do. He says, remember every good and perfect gift, it comes from above. You've got to get your eyes off of that thing that's in front of you and get your eyes up towards heaven, up towards your heavenly Father. 
from every good and perfect gift that comes down from, come on, fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the author and the finisher and the perfecter of your faith. Come on, get your eyes off of that shiny stuff, off the stuff that Satan is using for you to take the bait to destroy your life and get your eyes up. Cast your gaze towards heaven today. Change your focus. Change your thoughts. Put them on Jesus. Come on, he is good. He is loving. He is merciful. He longs to bless you with good things. Come on, he is for you today. He is enough. Come on, he is faithful today. He will give you the power to overcome. Put your eyes on Jesus, James says. Get your eyes on Jesus today. Stop trying to resist. See, when you just, when you try to win the war through resistance, it does not work. Because when you're resisting something, what are you thinking about? The very thing you're trying to resist. That's why this is true, that what you resist will persist. If you keep thinking, oh, I, gotta, I gotta stop thinking about that, I gotta stop thinking about that, I gotta stop thinking about that, what do you, what do you keep thinking about? The very thing you're trying to stop thinking about. That, that doesn't work. You know it doesn't work because you've tried it. The key isn't resisting. The key is refocusing. Change your thoughts. You'll change your life. Your life is moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Get your mind on God. Get your mind, fill it with his word. When you spend time with him in prayer and you sing and you worship, that's filling your mind with the goodness of God, with the, with the blessings of God, with the love of God. Don't be deceived, friends. Come on, fix your eyes on Jesus. Change your focus. Change your thoughts. And he will help you. And that brings us right back to where we started. Repent then. Turn to God. Why? So that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. You know, and as your pastor, that's just, that's what I want for you. It's what I want for me, my family. It's what I want for our church. That's what I want for the Poconos. That's what I want for the Lehigh Valley. That times of refreshing may come, but they come when we change our mind, when we repent. You change your mind of what's really going to bring you lasting satisfaction. I mean, really, do you think that thing is going to bring you lasting satisfaction? Oh, no, no, don't get me wrong. Sinning is fun. I've done it more than once. Sinning is fun. If, if you don't think sinning is fun, I don't think you're doing it right. <laughs> the Bible literally says sin is fun for a season. That's what it says. Read it, book of Hebrews. Sin is fun for a season, but eventually it leads to death. So you've got to change your mind. That's why I asked you to th some of the questions you need to think about. What are you thinking about? And what are you feeling right before you're ready to give in to that temptation? Are you thinking that that thing will really give you lifelong, worthwhile satisfaction? When the Bible clearly teaches that thing, will eventually lead to death. So change your mind. Call it for what it is. Yeah, it might be fun for a moment, but I'm not going to live my life for the moment. I'm going to live my life in light of eternity, in light of heaven. Because if I pass this test, if you pass this test, you will receive the crown. Of life. You know, that's the reason uh, why it's so critical as I close and the guys can come, the band. And I, I love what you said, David, in your story. It was so real. 
and so true. He, he literally admitted, I can't beat this thing on my own. I need a circle of friends that are going to help me. And that's why David leads a group around here. He's, he's trying to do for others what somebody did for him so that they can walk in the same sobriety and freedom and joy that he walks in today. And I'm just trying to say, this is, you know, the most important thing for so many of you, you love this church, you've been coming for some time now, but your level of engagement is you show up on a weekend and then you just go home. Friend, that's not enough to fight and win the fight. You need to enlist a circle of friends, some other men in your life that you can be real with, some other women in your life or some other couples in your life, depending on whatever age or stage that you're in, that you can just, like, be real with. Like David said, share your struggles. Like, this is where I'm at, and I guarantee you, they will not be there to judge you. They will be there to love you, help you. Because that's why we say around here all the time, this is a place where it's okay to not be okay. But we know it's not okay to stay that way, that with God's help and with a circle of friends, listen, we can learn to think like Jesus. And when you learn to think like him, when I learn to think like him, our life gets better. And we get better at life. And really, isn't that what you, isn't that what you want? I mean, honestly, that what's, isn't that what you really want? Well, that's the key. If you want to take back your life, you need to change your mind. Change your mind about temptation, to understand the purpose of it, to understand how God uses trials to grow us and Satan uses temptations to destroy us, to understand and remember that, hey, we're all in this together. Every, each one is tempted. You're not alone. To really figure out once and for all the, how the pattern of temptation works in your life. And then ultimately, change your focus and change your mind. And repent. Fix your eyes on Jesus and heaven that is waiting for you. Surround yourself with a group of people that can pray with you and encourage you. That you can be real and honest with. Hang out with them, you know, once every other week. You know, see what difference that makes in your life. And then God says this to you. When temptation comes into your life, remember that they're no different from what others commonly experience. God is faithful. He'll never let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Also, when you are tempted, He will show you a way out so that you will be able to withstand it. Friends, listen to me. There's always a way out. There's always a way out. There's always a way out. It might be hard. You might be going to rehab for 30 days. You might be going back to rehab. It might be humbling yourself and admitting to somebody that you care about and that you know cares about you, to tell them what it's really going. It might be getting some counseling. It might be joining a group. It might, it might be finding yourself at an altar somewhere and just really crying out to God. Maybe for the first time or the first time in a long time to spend some time with God and get real with Him because He already knows the truth. He's just waiting for you to humble yourself because that's a way out for you. There's a way out that God is faithful. That God is for you. And that with him on your side, you can win. Who's ready to win? I know I am. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word today. I know it wasn't an easy one. It was really hard to hear sometimes because I know all of us are thinking about the the stuff, the junk, the demons that we battle, the decisions that we make, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. 
But I pray that you'll remind us today that we're not alone. We're all in the same boat. We all face the same kind of temptation. But thanks also for reminding us that we can fight and we can win with you on our side. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, how many of you would say, and even those watching online, Dave, would you pray for me before I go because I'm battling temptation in my life? How many, just throw your hand up in the air. Would you be honest enough to say, yeah, I got some junk I'm dealing with. Would you pray for me? I see hands going up all over this place. Give this little hand raise emoji online. Well, God knows. Hey, we're all in this together. We all face it. It could be an attitude. It doesn't matter whether it could be food. It could be a substance, a chemical. It could be a mindset. We all face it. Thank you for having the courage to raise your hand. Let me pray for you, Father. You saw everyone online, everyone in the room. They're battling temptation. God, I pray that you would give them a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit. Fill their sails. Give them the courage to repent, to change their mind, to cry out to you, to find your grace and your salvation and your forgiveness that comes in your son's name, Jesus. God, help them get the courage to get the help that they need, to join a group, get a counselor. Whatever it is, God, to confess, whatever it is, God, give them the power to win. I come against all the schemes of the enemy that would try to destroy them right now in their mind, try to convince them that they could never win, that they could never fight this thing, that they're always going to lose. God, remind us. Remind them today. Greater is He that is within us than He that is in the world. Thank you, Father. We are more than conquerors. That you are faithful. We love you today. It's in your name we pray. Everybody said.